Hey everyone, Dr. Zach Greenweight here at Performance Sport and Spine, and today we'll be discussing sciatica. In this video, we'll be going over things such as updated definitions, relevant anatomy, what's actually causing the pain and symptoms that you're currently experiencing, what evidence there is that discs can heal, how to actually diagnose it, what role imaging plays in the pertinent red flags that you should be aware of, what's the general prognosis, and then lastly, we'll be discussing the different evidence for treatment options. This is my attempt to synthesize a bunch of different papers into a relatively digestible video. It's important to know this is purely for educational purposes and is not medical advice. So we've all heard the term sciatica. Unfortunately, it can mean different things to different people, and it's often used as a garbage can term to describe anyone that has pain in their back, glute, or hamstring. So we probably need more up-to-date definitions of what's actually happening. Lumbosacral radicular pain is a single symptom, usually pain, that arrives from one or more nerve roots that radiates down your leg, where lumbosacral radiculopathy would be multiple symptoms, such as weakness or numbness, arriving from one or more nerve roots. Next, we're going to discuss the relevant anatomy. So your spine has 22 bones called vertebrae that are broken down into three different sections. The top part is the cervical spine, the middle part is the thoracic spine, and the bottom part is the lumbar spine. This portion has five different segments. Now, between each bone is a disc. This disc has two different parts. The outer part is a collagen-like substance called the annulus fibrosus, which is very strong and resilient, and the inside is a nucleus pulposa that is a thick jelly-like substance. These discs are designed to absorb a large amount of load and allow little movement at each joint. Now, one important thing to note here is if you've heard the term the disc can slip, that isn't anatomically possible. The junction between the disc and the bone is incredibly strong, and that isn't gonna happen. Last thing to note in this section is that the nerve roots leave the spine at a thing called the foramen, which is where the disc can press on the nerve root. Now, the most affected nerves are typically L4, L5, and L5, S1, which we will discuss later. So what is actually causing the symptoms that you're experiencing? Now, when the disc gets pressed by the nerve through a disc herniation, that is most common, but it's important to note that other things can actually cause this, such as lumbar stenosis, which is narrowing of the central canal of the spinal column, spondyloecesis, this is when one vertebral body slips relevant to the other one, synovial cysts, tumor cancers, fractures, or congenital abnormalities. Now, for the purpose of this video, we'll be only discussing disc herniations. Historically, we thought that the disc pressing on the nerve was the whole picture, but it turns out that's only partially correct. So when the disc presses on the nerve, there causes a compression, which decreases blood flow, which causes ischemia, which can cause some of the symptoms. However, there's other things going on. That nucleus pulposa that we talked about, when it exits through the annulus fibrosa, it's foreign to the body and can cause an inflammatory process, which can also cause a large amount of pain. In addition, when that compression lasts long enough on the nerve, it can cause neuropathic pain, which is basically just cell death and degeneration. The last thing is that this inflammatory process, when it goes on, sensitizes the tissues. What this basically just means is that when you move through your day, the tissues are getting compressed and stretched. And normally that's not painful. But in sensitized tissues, this becomes very painful. So the important thing to note here is it's more than just the disc pressing on the nerve, which is why surgery isn't always the option. Let's talk about the risk factors for disc herniation. So it turns out there needs to be two components, a kindling and then a spark. And just like a fire, if you have a ton of kindling and no spark, it's not gonna go off. Or if you have a huge spark and no kindling, it's not gonna matter. So what are some of the kindling attributes? Smoking, obesity, manual work, and driving a lot where the sparks could be the things we talked about, such as disc lesions, stenosis, spondylolisthesis, cysts and tumors, infections, or neoplasm. So again, it's important to note that you need both of these components to make a perfect storm, and them in themselves is probably unlikely to cause the issue. One thing we wanna know is the difference between a disc bulge and a disc herniation. So if you look at the picture to my side, when the nucleus pulposa inside that disc expands more than 25% of the diameter, it's considered a disc bulge. If it's less than 25%, it's a disc herniation. So it may seem like a bulge is actually worse, but the difference is that when it expands more generalized, it's less likely to press on the nerve. When it's more focalized, it's more likely to press far enough to actually interact with the nerve root. Quickly, we wanna discuss the different subgroups of disc herniation. So there's three main types. There's protrusion where it presses out, but does not exit the annulus fibrosa. Extrusion, where the nucleus pulposa actually starts to exit the outer layer of the disc, and then sequestration, which is where the outer part actually breaks off and becomes its own little entity. Often when people hear about disc issues or disc herniations, it can be very scary for them, and it may be something that appears that they have to deal with forever. Luckily, there's a lot of strong evidence that shows that discs can heal and adapt over time. Let's look at two such studies. The first, Chu et al. in 2015, 
found that spontaneous remission happened in all kinds of disc bulges and disc herniations. And surprisingly, the more severe the herniation was, the faster it healed. Now the theory is, the more extreme the herniation is, the more the body feels like it's foreign and the faster it heals. Secondly, the Zong et al. study in 2017 found the overall spontaneous remission of lumbar disc herniations to be 66%. In this section, we're going to go over how to accurately diagnose sciatica. Now, there is no gold standard, but luckily it can be mostly a clinical diagnosis based off a good history and physical exam, and most guidelines don't suggest routine imaging. Now, clustering findings will help increase the likelihood that you have the right diagnosis, which we'll go over next. So for sciatica, the findings typically mean that the leg pain is worse than back pain, the pain radiates below the knee, it is localized to the dermatome of L4, L5, S1, there's a loss of function, such as that numbness or weakness that we talked about earlier. There are neural descriptors, which means the pain is kind of, the quality is sharp, stabby, or lanceating. And then there's a positive straight leg raise test, which is a test that we use to increase the tension on the nerve root to try to reproduce the symptoms. Now, if it's more referred pain, the findings would probably be more like low back pain is worse than leg pain. It's poorly localized, non-dermatomal. The quality of the pain is probably reported as dull or achy and the straight leg raise test is negative. Now, if you look at this picture to the side of me, you'll see that the L4 nerve root radiates the anterior leg, the L5 nerve root radiates the lateral leg and the toe, and the S1 nerve root, which is the most common one to deal with, is the posterior leg and calf. Now, based off these different innervations, we can kind of help correlate our diagnosis. Now, one important thing to note here is that there actually is variance in everyone's dermatomal patterns, but that's beyond the scope of this video, but it's just important to be aware. Now, there are a few differential diagnoses that we need to rule out when there's appearance of sciatica. First, the hip joint itself can refer pain down the leg. However, this person will probably present with limping or an altered gait. Secondly is lumbar stenosis, which we talked about earlier is the central canal is narrowing, causing compression or irritation of the spinal cord. Typically though, this person will present with bilateral symptoms, pain better with sitting and worse with walking or standing. Another one is vascular clarification, which can cause pain in the, the legs, but however, this will be worse with exertion and better with rest. And then diabetic neuropathy, which is where diabetes needs to be ruled out. What role does imaging play with sciatica? First off, x-rays are not helpful as they only address the bone structures of your spine. And secondly, most guidelines don't recommend MRIs until six to 12 weeks of conservative care has been tried and the patient is non-responsive. Another important thing to note here is that the clinical signs and symptoms should always correlate with the radiographic findings. We would argue that imaging is only necessary if it changes the course of management. If an MRI is taken, but you're still gonna do PT or conservative care, it's probably not necessary until the point of injection or surgery is a viable option. There are a few medical red flags that we need to go over. The first being cauda equini syndrome. Now the cauda equini is a nerve bundle directly below the spinal cord in the lumbar spine. Now when the disc presses on this, it can be a medical emergency and symptoms can typically be urinary retention, groin numbness, and decrease in anal sphincter tone. Another one is progressive or sudden neurological deficits, such as motor weakness. Any history of trauma should be warranted, as well as any suspicion of infection, cancers, or malignancy. Lastly, potentially severe acute cases may be a medical referral. So what does it look like for the prognosis of sciatica? Now this will vary a little bit on the population, but overall it appears that one third of people will get better in two weeks. Three quarters of people will improve within 12 weeks. However, one third of people will still have persistent and disabling symptoms after one year. The important thing to take away from this is that not all cases of sciatica are the same and there are subgroups, which makes it important that medical care is individualized to the person. What does the evidence say about the different treatment options for sciatica? We will cover that now. So first off is exercise. A systematic review by Fernandez et al. in 2015 found that no specific exercise was superior to others and that managing pain and maintaining function were the primary outcomes. Two important things to note here is that bed rest is not recommended and that stability exercises are not superior to other exercises for this condition. For electrotherapies and traction, both continuous and intermittent, a Cochrane review by Clark et al. as well as the NEES guidelines do not recommend this for the treatment of sciatica. As for neurodynamics and manual therapy, they should be used as a conjunction with other treatments, but not used as a standalone treatment. This was found by Hidalgo et al. in 2014. For medications, a systematic review by Pinto et al. in 2012 found that paracetamol, NSAIDs, antidepressants, anticonvulsants, muscle relaxers, and opiates were not helpful 
in the management of sciatic pain. Other studies have shown a small and short-term effect for corticosteroids in drugs like gabapentin. However, this remains unclear the utility in the primary care setting and future research is needed. For injections, a study by Oliveira et al. in 2020 did show a short-term pain relief, but no difference in pain or disability outcomes at one and two year follow-up. Some guidelines recommend it and others don't, so it appears that it may be suitable for some cases and not others. Lastly, we'll discuss surgical interventions. Two different systematic reviews by Fernandez et al. in 2015 and Jacobs et al. in 2011 did show short-term pain reduction and improvement in disability versus controls. However, there was no difference in pain or function at one to two year follow-ups. Three things to note about surgery is most clinical guidelines do support surgery for some severe cases, cases that have not responded to conservative care over six to 12 weeks, and any medical red flags. Thank you so much for watching our video today. We really hope you found this helpful. In summary, the take-home message is, it's very important for an accurate diagnosis. That's mostly clinical. Routine imaging is not recommended. Each case is different, so your prognosis may be different than someone else's. It's more than just a disc pressing on a nerve, which is why surgery is not always needed for successful outcomes. There's strong evidence that discs can heal. Sciatica can be both physically and mentally exhausting. It's important to refer out for any pertinent red flags and surgery and injections may be viable for some specific cases.